EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled Bore Scope Ascendancy, and our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management. He's author for numerous aviation publications. He's a certified flight instructor. He's an A&P mechanic with inspection authorization. 2008, he was the FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year. Mike's a member of EAA volunteering his time to be with us and sharing this wonderful information. Mike, thank you so much. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Well, my pleasure, Tim. Good evening, everybody. Well, I am uh, doing the, tonight's webinar from a slightly unusual place. Um, I uh, came down to L.A. for the 4th of July holiday, and I um, one of the primary reasons was uh, to to go to the Fourth uh, of July concert at the Hollywood Bowl, complete with all of the spectacular uh, fireworks and stuff. It was it was quite an amazing uh, amazing show. I'd seen a lot of fireworks before. I'd never quite seen fireworks as well synchronized with a full symphony orchestra before. It was really pretty spectacular, and I hope. Uh, Everybody had a uh, had a very good Fourth uh, of July holiday. Um, anyway, the subject for tonight is uh, is bore scopes. We're going to be talking about um, the uh, uh, the increasing uh, role of bore scopes in in uh, piston general aviation maintenance over the last thirty three years or so. Um, this picture is a is a photograph of uh, of my friend Adrian Icorn. He's uh, He's got a borescope probe sticking in the top spark plug hole of a cylinder, and he's taking a very close look at an exhaust valve on a big screen TV here. We'll be seeing a lot of um, a lot of borescope pictures as we go on tonight, but let's start uh, start at the beginning, um, and that's with the differential compression test. Uh, the compression test is um, has been in use. Uh, for more than 80 years in piston aviation. Um, I think it came after the Wright brothers, I'm not sure, but not a whole lot after. <laughs> and uh, for a very long time, it has been the uh, primary way that mechanics gauge the health of uh, cylinders on piston aircraft engines and how they make decisions as to when uh, cylinder maintenance is required and when cylinder removal uh, needs to happen. Um, uh, and th the use of the differential compression test has undergone s some some pretty spectacular changes um, in the last 33 years. Um, prior to 1984, um, and I'll tell you the significance of that date in a minute, but prior to 1984, um, the compression test was pretty much the sole way that we assessed um, the uh, the condition of, of cylinders. And the conventional wisdom was, um, you know, you pump 80 PSI air into a cylinder through a, 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 a calibrated orifice, and uh, you essentially read the uh, differential between the air going into the orifice and the air on the other side of the orifice, which is a measure of how much leakage, uh, air leakage there is in that pressurized cylinder. So the readings are something over 80. The left gauge says 80, the right gauge says something, and, the, and, and we say the cylinder measured something over 80. And the conventional wisdom up until 1984 was um, we really wanted to see numbers in the 70s. High, uh, you know, high 70s over 80 were excellent. Low 70s over 80 were, were pretty good. When we started to get down into the 60s, um, uh, the cylinder was considered to be getting marginal. When it got to the low 60s, it was considered to be getting in pretty serious trouble. And um, any reading below 60 over 80 was considered unairworthy. And in fact, um, that magic. 60 over 80 you know, is is uh, memorialized in some FAA publications um, that that, that uh, 
are no longer particularly relevant, but but that's that's how strong this this uh, tradition was of saying that cylinders that had compression readings below 60 over 80 are unairworthy and have to come off. Uh, and most um, ANPs believed that the compression reading that you got when you measured a cylinder was an accurate representation of um, whether the cylinder was able to produce full rated horsepower. And engines with compressions in the 60s were considered by most mechanics to be tired and, and incapable of putting out full rated horsepower. So the, the, again, the conventional wisdom was that when the compressions got started to get down into the 60s, it was, it was actually um, a, a safety issue because the engine wasn't able to produce full power. That turned out to be wrong. Um, in 1984, Continental Motors issued service bulletin M8415, um, which was a, a real groundbreaking change in how to look at compression readings. And in M8415, it was published in 1984, Continental um, set a, established new criteria uh, go, no go criteria for when a cylinder was considered air, unairworthy based on compression readings. And um, they didn't actually give a specific number. What they did was, was um, require that mechanics um, take their compression tester and test it against a calibrated master orifice, which represented the maximum acceptable leakage. And whatever number they got when they tested the orifice was the no-go number for that day. Any cylinder that measured below that value um, was considered unairworthy. And the, these no-go values varied from tester to tester a little bit and varied from day to day a little bit. But most of most of the time, uh, when you measured the Maris Master Orifice, the reading, uh, the go no go threshold, was somewhere down in the low to mid 40s. And uh, this really astonished mechanics because the, again, the conventional wisdom and what they were all taught in A and P school was that you know compression readings below 60 were unairworthy, and for Continental to come along and say you know, 60s are okay, 50s are okay, high 40s are even still okay, and you have to get down to the low to mid 40s before we think that the cylinder has unacceptable leakage. That was a pretty big revolution, um, and uh, uh, a lot of mechanics had a very hard time accepting that. But it turns out that, that the background behind this service bullet in M8415 involved some, some pretty good science. Um, Continental um, did a bunch of uh, engineering studies in which they took an IO550 Continental engine and ran it up in a, the, dy the dynamometer test cell that they have at the factory at Mobile, Alabama. And they progressively reduced the compression of the cylinders intentionally uh, by filing the, the compression ring gaps oversize and intentionally introducing leakage um, and progressively reduced the compression of the cylinders and measured what horsepower the engine put out on the dynamometer. And uh, interestingly enough, it turns out that an IO550 engine with all six cylinders measuring 40 over 80 compression produced exactly the same horsepower as one with 75 over 80 compressions. So that is, as the compression decreased from the mid 70s to the low 40s, there was absolutely zero impact on the ability of the engine to put out horsepower. That flew in the face of what almost all mechanics believed at the time. Um, and it represented a new basis for how we should be looking at compression tests. Um, the other thing that came out of continental studies was even more interesting, I think. Um, and it showed that differential compression tests um, are very non-reproducible. And that if you follow a cylinder's compression, um, 
over time, it can gyrate wildly in ways that can't possibly have anything to do with the actual uh, condition of the cylinder. Uh, the, the, the wild gyrations have to do with the fact that the test is not a very good test and it's not particularly reproducible. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here is a graph from a continental um, endurance test uh, on a TSIO 520 UB engine. Um, Continental for certification purposes is required by the FAA to run 600 hour compression tests or 600 hour endurance tests where they run the engines pretty much flat out at redline um, for 600 hours and then tear them down and, and see what their condition is. And um, so during this 600 hour endurance test, um, every 50 hours or so, very little bit, they, they would shut down the engine and they would do a compression test, among other things. They change the oil, they do a bunch of stuff, and then they continue this endurance test. And this, this uh, chart shows the compression readings they got uh, during that 600 hour endurance test. And you can see that the compression started up in the, in, in, in the 70s, where you kind of expect them to be on new engine, uh, rapidly declined to the low 60s, uh, stayed there for a little while, then declined uh, down to 56 over 80. This is on a brand new engine. And then miraculously bounced back into the 70s and then declined in, uh, a little bit into the high 60s and then soared back up to uh, 74 over 80, which was better than what it was when it was new, and then started de decreasing again. And, you know, do you really believe that this cylinder you know, got got real sick at 200 hours and then magically cured itself and, and, and became better than new when it got to 450 hours? Obviously not. Uh, what this is telling us is that the compression test is it, it just has terrible reproducibility. There's, there's more noise in the readings than there is actual uh, data relating to the, to the condition of the cylinder. And when that happens, when, when you test the same thing over and over and you get wildly varying results, um, we say that the, the, the test is a low reliability test uh, and, and the compression test absolutely qualifies as a very low reliability test. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, the two takeaways of the research was one, there's no relationship between engine performance and compression and two, uh, the compression test is highly unreliable. Um, that ultimately caused Continental to rethink the whole subject of compression tests and introduce the borescope as, uh, as, as part of the picture. And they did that in 2003. In 2003, um, Continental issued a new service bulletin called SB03-3, which superseded uh, that previous M84-15 uh, service bulletin. It, it kept the same go-no-go no go thresholds for compressions, that is something down in the low to mid 40s based on a master orifice reading. But it basically said, anytime you do a compression test, you also have to do a borescope inspection. And if the borescope inspection and the compression test disagree, the, basically, you want to you want to believe the borescope. You want to believe what you see with your own eyes, rather than that highly unreliable compression test reading. It's a little bit more subtle than that, but that's that was kind of the essence of what Continental um, came up with in uh, in 2003. And that guidance is still uh, unchanged as Continental's guidance to this day. Um, so SBO 3-3 makes it clear that the borescope not the compression tester, is the gold standard for assessing airworthiness of a cylinder. And what it actually says is that you have to do a borescope inspection every time you do a compression test. And for most of us, that means at least at annual inspection time when, when the compression test is actually required by the regulations. And if a cylinder flunks the compression test, and for Continental engines, flunking means 
uh, a compression down around 40 or less. Um, but the bore scope does not reveal any obvious cause uh, for the cylinder uh, to, to flunk the test. And we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at a lot of bore scope pictures as we go along here, so you'll see what I'm talking about. But if, if, if the compression test says the cylinder is bad, but the bore scope says it's okay, then we don't trust the bore scope reading. And that's an SBO 3-3 instructs that the engine should be flown for at least 45 minutes and then the compression rechecked hot. And only if the cylinder flunked its compression test a second time is the cylinder deemed to be unairworthy. Um, and it's very, very common. In fact, it's, 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 it's almost the rule that if you go fly the airplane for an hour and retest that one cylinder that flunked hot, you'll get a much better reading than you got the first time you did it. In fact, um, I remember one of, one of my customers uh, that, that, that has a Cirrus SR-22 based down in Florida brought his um, Cirrus in for an annual a few years ago. The shop did the compression test. One of the cylinders me measured 38 over 80. Uh, which was below the master orifice uh, threshold. The mechanic um, reported that and said that they needed to pull the jug. We said, no, don't pull the jug. We want you to follow the terms and conditions of SBO 38-3 exactly. Um, uh, have the airplane flown uh, and then recheck it. So uh, after a little toing and froing with the A&P, he agreed to let the owner fly the airplane. He flew the airplane for an hour, brought it back, they put a compression tester on it, and that same cylinder tested 72 over 80 uh, on, the, on the retest. So, you know, Continental knew what it was talking about when it issued, uh, when it issued SBO 3-3. By the way, SBO 3-3 actually doesn't exist anymore. Last year, Continental rescinded SBO 3-3 and a whole bunch of other service bulletins as separate service bulletins, and they incorporated all of that stuff verbatim into a new maintenance manual called Manual X X-0. Um, so if you look at look for SBO 3-3 on the web with Google, you'll probably find a couple of copies of it from uh, that, that other companies have posted there, but you won't find a copy. Uh, posted by Continental anymore because they've taken that service bulletin and, and incorporated it into a maintenance manual and rescinded it as a service bulletin in order to give it more legal teeth than, than a service bulletin has. Since Part 91 operators are not required to to comply with service bulletins, but they are required to do what the manual says. So that's why Continental did that. Um, now, back in 2003, which is um, about 14 years ago, um, the uh, the service bullet that Continental issued recommended the use of uh, this uh, bore scope that's pictured here on the slide. It was called a Lennox Autoscope. It was a simple optical bore scope that was designed for automotive use, and it cost about two grand. At that time, um, not very many A&Ps owned a bore scope or knew how to use one. Um, and a lot of them weren't particularly amused that Continental was going to force them to go out and buy a $2,000 bore scope. Um, but at any rate, that was the state of the art in 2003 when, when Continental essentially introduced boroscopy into, uh, into the maintenance of piston aircraft engines. We've come a long way uh, in that in that uh, 14 intervening 14 years. Today, and I did use uh, th that that um, Lennox uh, unit uh, for many years. Uh, today, I use uh, the uh, bore scope that's pictured here, called the Vividia Able Scope VA400. It costs two hundred dollars rather than two thousand dollars, and is vastly more capable. Um, than the than the two thousand dollar bore scope was uh, back in two thousand and three. It's an electronic unit rather than an optical one. It's got a high resolution camera. Uh, it can it, it's got a USB cable so you can view the images on on a tablet, um, on a phone, um, 
on a laptop computer or, or even hook it to a big screen TV. Um, and uh, it also has a really cool capability that the that the old borescopes didn't have, and that is a variable viewing angle. Um, the it's it's constructed in a way that that you press a plunger at the end of of the handle, and it will it curls the the tip that has the camera in it um, to any angle that you want from zero degrees that is looking straight uh you know st straight at, uh, down the barrel so you know maybe looking at the piston crown uh to curving all the way back to 180 degrees and which is great for looking back at the valves um you can adjust it to 90 degrees which is great for looking at cylinder walls it and and it's it's infinitely adjustable it's a really really cool capability and makes makes it possible to get much better um, uh, photographs inside cylinders than the old horoscopes that had a fixed viewing angle of 90 degrees uh, that was not changeable. Um, as I said, it's got a USB cable. It'll plug into essentially any anything that has a USB capability and, 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 uh, and dis display images on, on the, that device's screen. And it, there is also an optional Bluetooth adapter. I don't use it, but you can get an optional Bluetooth adapter for a little bit of extra money uh, so that the, the, the borescope talks wirelessly to um, a tablet or a laptop or whatever. Um, I've tried the, the Bluetooth adapter. I actually borrowed a friend's uh, adapter and played with it a little bit. I didn't particularly like it because it introduced a little delay into the images. Um, but it is, but it is also available. And this thing is amazingly inexpensive. Um, again, you can hook it to a big screen display. Um, um, my my friend. Uh, Phil Kirkham, who runs the shop at, at my home airport of Santa Maria, uh, has his borescope hooked to a big screen display so that when he's borescoping cylinders, the aircraft owner can, can stand there and, and see everything that he sees, and then they can discuss the condition of the cylinder and discuss you know, whether any, anything needs to be done to it. It's a really nice capability. You can buy one of these for video able scopes on Amazon. Uh, it's one hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety eight cents as of yesterday. Um, and uh, if you're a prime member, it shows up in two days with zero shipping charges. It's really quite uh, quite remarkable. Um, so the, these scopes have been so inexpensive and so capable that every mechanic and probably every maintenance involved aircraft owner who works on his airplane and does you know spark plug changes and things, um, really ought to own one. They're, they're very cheap, and they are they, they just change the whole equation about how we how we monitor the condition of cylinders. Um, so let's let's shift and, and take a look at, at what we see through a borescope, um, what 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 we're looking for when we look at, at borescope images. Um, one of the problems that we have is that. Um, that a &Ps typically have received no training in piston engine boroscopy when they went through a &P school. And um, so there's, there's a big learning curve there. And, you know, actually the, the value of a borescope inspection isn't, real, isn't any better than, the, than the, the training of the eyeball that's looking at the images. So I, I want to go through with you, you know, what we're looking for and, and uh, teach you enough that you can look in a cylinder and, and, and make a pretty good assessment for yourself as to what the condition is. And if you're having your plane um, inspected at a shop, you can look over the A&P shoulder and look at, the, look at the images and come to your own conclusions. Um, the things, the, the key components we're looking for, I mean, when we stick a borescope into a spark plug hole, we're, we're looking inside the combustion chamber. And the primary things that we are looking for when we look in there are the exhaust valves and seats, the intake valves and seats, the condition of the cylinder barrels, and the condition of the piston crown. And we'll look at pictures of all of those things. Of all of that, the most important thing that we're looking at 
it, or exhaust valves and seats because that's the most failure prone component of the cylinder and that's really um, pretty much the only component in the cylinder that is likely to cause any sort of a catastrophic uh, failure of the cylinder. Um, so there's a big concentration on exhaust valve simply because that's the most vulnerable and failure prone part. But of course, when we stick a bore scope in, we, we take a look around at everything we can see. Um, let's look at a couple of exhaust valves. This is a healthy exhaust valve. Um, it, it, uh, the, the way we know it's healthy is not, you know, by its color or anything. It's by the fact that it appears symmetrical. This particular one looks pretty much like a bullseye. Um, the fact that the exhaust valve looks symmetrical, and we're obviously seeing a bunch of combustion deposits on the face of the exhaust valve, um, the fact that those deposits are symmetrical uh, tell us that the valve has a symmetrical heat pattern, um, that it's running about the same temperature all around the circumference of the valve. And that tells us that the valve is not leaking, because if the valve was leaking, the place where it was leaking would be running hotter than the rest of the valve. And we would see that um, when we looked at it with a bore scope, because the, the pattern of combustion deposits on the valve would be asymmetrical. There would be less deposits at the place where the valve was running hotter. So for example, uh, this valve is a very sick valve. You can see that it's a highly asymmetrical pattern. It doesn't look anything like the one we were looking at in the previous slide. Um, and, and it's pretty clear that different portions of the valve circumference are, are operating at very different temperatures. Um, it takes a slightly more educated eye to tell which which part of the valve is hot and which is cold. It turns out that the hot spot on this valve is up at the 12 o'clock position. Um, and um, it it is displaying a, a greenish tinge. I'm not sure how well you can see that, um, but that, that upper portion of the valve is displaying a greenish tinge, which is a sign that the valve is very, very sick. Um, the green appears only when the valve's operating temperature gets very, very high. And when we see a greenish tinge like that, we know that this valve is on its last legs and is literally on the verge of failing. And if it failed, it, the way it would fail is that a chunk of that that valve up in a, roughly the 12 o'clock position would break off. And when it broke off, uh, the exhaust valve no longer could seal, of course, and the cylinder's compression would go to zero and it would shut down the cylinder. So you'd be running a five-cylinder engine if it used to be six, a three-cylinder engine if it used to be four. And then that little chunk of metal that came off the exhaust valve um, would normally probably just go out the exhaust. Um, but if it was a turbocharged engine, it might go through the turbocharger and take out the turbocharger. So. We don't, we don't like to see these things fail, and that's the reason that it's very important to inspect them on a regular basis. Um, here's another healthy valve. Um, it doesn't look particularly like the first one we saw, which was also healthy, but there's no um, significant asymmetry available on this valve. This one really doesn't look that much like a bullseye. It kind of looks like a burnt pizza, but the key thing is that it's symmetrical. It doesn't show any evidence of a hot spot. So this valve is okay. Um, the exhaust deposits on this valve are a little heavy, which suggests to me that the person who was operating this engine was not leaning as aggressively as, as I would like to see. Um, but there isn't any reason to think that this exhaust valve is in any sort of jeopardy because there's no obvious asymmetry. And that's really what we're looking for. Um, here's another valve that was run quite lean because the amount of exhaust deposits on it is very, very low. Um, and usually that's a good thing. But this thing is, this one is asymmetric. It's got, it's got a greenish tinge again up at the 12 o'clock position. 
and um, it's uh, it's on its way very quickly to to failing because there's obviously a serious hot spot up at the top. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of, of what we look for when we look at a valve. Now those valves we were just looking at the face of the of the closed valve. But when we do a bore scope inspection, we also want to rotate the propeller until the valve is, is fully open and then work the bore scope in as best we can to get a look at what the sealing surface of the valve on the back side of the valve looks like and what the mating surface on the seat looks like. And what we're hoping that they look like, and we can't see all 360 degrees around there, but we can we can see a pretty good representative sample of of, of both the valve sealing surface and the seat's um, mating surface. Um, and what we're looking for there is primarily that those two surfaces be nice and clean and shiny um, and free of excessive deposits. This one looks very, very nice. Um, the, the, the valve's um, sealing surface is clean and, and shiny. The, the um, Valve seat looks pretty good. There's there's a little speck of of white stuff up there, uh, kind of near the top of it. But but by and large, it looks quite clean. And again, this is all very very positive. This is this is very nice looking. Um, you can see if you can see around the seat that there's some uh, residue of of metallic lead, um, which um, it generally, generally suggests, suggests that the engine was was run kind of on the rich side. side. Um, for, for some, some reason that I've never quite understood, we tend to see larger amounts of lead build up on Lycoming engines than, than we do on Continental engines. Um, but uh, again, that's not not that's not really here nor there in terms of cylinder condition. It's just you can see a lot of interesting things when you look at a cylinder in a bore scope, and you can not only tell the health of the cylinder, but you can often Tell, tell quite, quite a bit about, about how the pilot was operating the engine. Um, here's another uh, open exhaust valve. And in this case, it's not looking nearly as good as the previous one. You can see the seat has quite a lot of white deposits uh, build up on it. And the ceiling surface on the valve, the back side of the valve, um, uh, is, is uh, moderately contaminated and, and it doesn't look nice and and clean and shiny like the other one um, and that buildup of uh, deposits on the ceiling surfaces um, most likely would wind up re being reflected in um, in poor compression readings because air could could leak out there it might it would probably have less effect when the engine was actually running but it would probably cause low compression readings. Well, when we, we see something, something like this, this um, it, it, we generally can, can correct it without pulling the cylinder. We, we, we basically we just drop the exhaust and work through the exhaust port to put, put a little bit of a, a valve grinding compound on there and then spin the, spin the valve in the seat, to try to clean that, clean that stuff off. And we've been real successful, particularly in Lycoming engines with bringing up compression readings pretty dramatically that way without pulling the cylinder. If, if the compression problem is a problem like this, where it's a, where, where, where the reason for the low compression is, is simply a buildup of, of deposits on the seat or the uh, ceiling surface of the valve as opposed to, um, you know, a serious hot spot where the valve is uh, about to break off. In that case, we, we have to pull the cylinder and replace the valve. Um, of, of course, course there's, there's two valves in every cylinder. cylinder. Um, you, you can, can always tell the exhaust valve from the intake valve because the exhaust valve is the little one and the intake valve is the big one. Uh, we very seldom have um, problems with intake valves because they tend to run pretty cool. Um, uh, sometimes we will see oil leakage through the exhaust valve and through the intake valve indicating a uh, um, a bad uh, oil seal on the valve and that sort of thing. So we do inspect them, uh, but it's it's pretty unusual to have to pull a cylinder because of an intake valve problem. That happens very very rarely. It's, the, the exhaust valve is the is the troublesome one because it runs very hot. Um, 
The AOPA Air Safety Foundation produced a great poster that was um, uh, largely done by my friend Adrian Eichhorn with a little help from me. Um, that is available online, or, or you can actually call the, the Air Safety Foundation and they'll send you a full-size poster suitable for hanging on the side of your mechanics toolbox. But it's a, it's a big a big poster that has a bunch of pictures of of healthy exhaust valves and sick exhaust valves with lots of interesting information about uh, um, uh, about how to interpret what what you see under the bore scope. And uh, it, to find it online, um, you can just Google the phrase "anatomy of an exhaust valve failure," and it'll take you. It'll take you right to it. And it's, it's a pretty cool poster. Um, occasionally, when we're looking in the combustion chamber with a bore scope, we see um, things that we don't expect to see. That this is uh, showing a couple of, of cylinder head cracks. One that's in, that that uh, it started at the exhaust valve um, seat boss and is growing towards the uh, upper spark plug hole, and another one from the upper spark plug hole that's growing in the other direction. Uh, this is not good news if you see this because this clearly means that the cylinder is unairworthy, needs to come off. Um, but it's just another another example of the kinds of things that you can see in a bore scope inspection that you would not find out uh, in a compression test until the cylinder was cracked through its 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 entire uh, its entire thickness. Um, we we will typically take a pretty good look at the condition of the cylinder barrel. Um, uh, again. Uh, putting the bore scope in a 90 degree viewing angle to do that and looking around at the cylinder walls this this is a pretty healthy looking cylinder it's it's obviously a, a, a worn cylinder um, but there is still just a trace of the original crosshatch hone pattern visible and there aren't any obvious flaws that would cause one to to be concerned um, the thing in the bottom is the piston. Here's, Here's another cylinder that is not in such good shape. shape. Uh, and, and if you look at it, you can see there's a fair amount of pitting and uh, some vertical scoring on the cylinder walls. Um, so this this cylinder most likely is starting to burn some oil and, and uh, is definitely uh, getting worn out. Um, this, this wouldn't necessarily be grounds for pulling the cylinder yet, but it's kind of a warning sign, um, unless the oil consumption was so high that it was deemed unacceptable. Uh, here's another cylinder that's in a lot worse shape. You can see it's got some really serious corrosion damage, obviously, uh, due to, uh, uh, to long periods of disuse where the oil film stripped away and allowed the cylinder to rust. It also has pitting and vertical scoring, but the, the real obvious feature on this one is the corrosion damage. Again, again, caused, caused by, by disuse, and uh, we unfortunately see that a lot on on airplanes that don't fly a lot and live in high corrosion areas like uh, like you know South Florida or uh, or Houston or something like that, where the corrosion risk is really high. Uh, other things that we can see under the bore scope um, is uh, a detonation damage. This is a a cylinder head that that that's that sustained mild detonation damage. Uh, and detonation damage uh, generally shows up as, as kind of a sandblasted uh, area. Um, if it's if it's heavy detonation, it can almost look like uh, like the area was was beaten with a with a ball peen hammer. Uh, in this case, it was it was light detonation, but but enough to leave some signatures on the cylinder head in a couple of areas. Um, and, and we, we also, also will see that same appearance, and uh, in the case of heavy detonation, pockmarked appearance on the uh, on the crown of the piston. Um, the pistons tend to be pretty vulnerable to detonation damage. Uh, here's here's a seriously detonation damaged piston um, with a lot of metal erosion, and this this was probably a very serious detonation event, and most likely this particular cylinder wound up being toast. Um, here's another interesting thing that we that we will once in a great while see 
on when we're looking at a piston crown is is a little half moon shaped indentation, which is um, as the signature of the valve strike, uh, where the uh, the piston actually came up and, and contacted the edge of uh, one of the valves, most most commonly the exhaust valve, uh, and left a little indentation in the piston crown. Um, that can happen for two reasons. Um, it could be caused by a stuck valve uh, that 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 where that where the valve was incapable of retracting in, into the exhaust valve, and so the uh, into the exhaust uh, in, 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 you know through the, through the exhaust guide. I mean, uh, it was incapable of closing because it got stuck, and then the piston came up and hit it. But another time that we'll see. Valve strikes is when the engine suffers a, a serious RPM overspeed, um, and the the piston is coming up so rapidly because the RPM is too high that the uh, that the valve can't close fast enough to avoid being being hit by the piston. I, I, I you know recently had a guy call me who had had an overspeed on, a, on an IO three sixty engine, and was getting a large group of uh, opinions as to whether the engine could remain in service or or be uh, or, or need to be torn down and i suggested that he do a bore scope inspection and look for valve strike signatures if he saw any valve strike signatures then he probably should tear down the engine if he didn't see any he probably died with the bullet so at any rate the uh, some of the takeaways of all this um, modern bore scopes are both inexpensive and extremely capable uh, I think everyone should have one. Um, at 200 bucks, everybody can afford to have one. Uh, the bore scope inspection is a far more reliable and revealing test of cylinder airworthiness than the compression test. Um, I, I had um, an executive of Continental Motors some years ago tell me um, privately, not to be repeated, that that you know that if Continental could do away with the compression test, they would, but they can't because it's written right into the FAA, FAA regulations. So we have to do compression tests, but you know Continental says anytime you do a compression test, you have to do a bore scope inspection as well. And if the two disagree, the bore scope inspection is probably right, and the compression test is probably wrong, uh, because as we've seen, compression tests tend to be very. Uh, uh, unreliable. Lycoming has been much more traditional in its guidance. It does have some guidance that um, that encourages but does not require bore scope inspections and its go-no-go no go thresholds on compression tests are the traditional 60 over 80 um, uh, threshold that, 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 that's you know, been in use since, since Methuselah, Methuselah had pups, <laughs> um, and, and you know, I, I think it would be really great if Lycoming uh, brought their guidance, you know, kind of into the 21st century the way Continental has, and and, and emphasize the, that the bore scope is a better way of of, of making decisions on cylinder replacement. Uh, but uh, at the moment. Um, the Lycoming's guidance is still kind of the old-fashioned traditional guidance that that uh, is heavily reliant on on compression test readings. Lycoming's guidance is actually a little gives the 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 mechanic a little wiggle room, and it basically it 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 says if if um, if, if uh, the compression is lower than 60 over 80. I, I forget the exact words. It's basically the mechanic should seriously consider removing the cylinder, but it doesn't actually mandate it. And uh, you, you wouldn't really be breaking any rules if you if you uh, um, if you had a cylinder, a Lycoming cylinder under 60 over 80 that that had a that looked good under the bore scope. Uh, you wouldn't really be breaking any rules by by leaving it in service, although very few. Mechanics have the uh, the courage to do that, um, but my view is that you know maybe it's time that we should retire the compression test once and for all, and start using the the bore scope uh, as as our as our guidance for when to uh, replace cylinders. So Tim, that's that's all of the uh, the prepared material I have for tonight. We can open it up for Q and A.
Okay, okay Mike, Mike, thanks. thanks. Uh, We've got a number of questions in here, so uh, let's get right into them. First, just a comment from Paul Shuck. He said, uh, please don't forget to mention European engines uh, such as Rotex. The reference pressure is not 80 PSI, but rather 6 bar, which is 87 PSI. And I'm sure there are lots of lots of American mechanics with, with gauges that, that are calibrated in, in, in bar. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> James says, uh, if all differential compression tests show good results, is there any point in also doing a bore scope evaluation? Well, my, I mean, my answer is absolutely, because as you could see, the, the, the bore scope shows you know, you know lots, lots of things that the compression, compression tester doesn't, doesn't show. Um, you know, you know the, the, the compression tester wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't show pitting, pitting or vertical scoring or rust marks. marks. That you typically see that in uh, in in increased oil consumption. Um, it sort the the compression test certainly wouldn't show detonation damage. Um, the compression test might tell you that there's massive, massive amounts of air leaking, leaking out the exhaust valve. valve. But, but what it won't tell you is whether it's because the exhaust valve is toast or whether it's just because there's some some deposit buildup on the seat that could probably be easily cleaned off without pulling the cylinder. So the, 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 it just it seems to me that Continental got this right, that, that any time you do a, a compression test, you ought to be doing a borescope inspection. Uh, and I, I would go further than that and say, any any time you have a spark plug out, it's it, 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 to me it seems almost malpractice not to stick a bore scope in the spark plug hole while it's open. Um, it's I mean it's, it's the same thing. If you if you if you had a cylinder off an engine, wouldn't you stick your head in there and take a look at the cam? Wouldn't it be almost malpractice not to, not to take that opportunity to inspect the cam? And I, it seems to me the same applies to boroscopy. Any any time we have a a hole, a hole in the in the, in the top, top of the cylinder. cylinder. We ought to stick a bore scope in there and look around. It, it only takes a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Philip, Philip was wondering, wondering uh, getting back to the Continental test, test where they, where they tested, tested compression over the 600 hours. hours. Do you know if that was uh, with, with a cold cylinder or a, a warm engine when they did that test? Well, I wasn't there, but but you know, Continental's guidance is pretty clear that the the compression test should be done hot. So I I assume that the Continental did did the compression readings hot. I I can't absolutely verify that, and that happened quite a long time ago. I'm guessing that the a lot of people who were involved in doing that test probably are retired by now. Chris is wondering: Has any research been conducted into the causes of the unreliability of the compression test? Is it, is it a, a test, test equipment, equipment issue or a test, test procedure issue? It, it's really not a test equipment issue, although we do see some variation in calibration from one valve to another when it when when it's when the, the gauge is calibrated against a master orifice. The, the big problem is 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 um, it, it has to do with the fundamental procedure itself. Um, the, 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 one of the biggest problems with the compression test is that we're testing the cylinder under grossly unrealistic conditions that have almost nothing to do with what the actual compression of the cylinder would be, the, 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 the actual, how should I say this, the actually, actual ability to have good combustion chamber sealing when the engine is actually running. We're, we're testing the cylinders at a, at a much, much, much colder, colder temperature, temperature than their full operating temperature. temperature. Um, and, and as a result, with, with uh, you know, steel cylinders and, 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 and aluminum and pistons, the, the, the piston fits very, very sloppily in the cylinder at the temperatures that we're using to do the test. The piston, the piston feel, fits very snugly in the cylinder when the engine is actually running. It's a whole different situation. Um, the, the valves, when they're, when they're closed, closed um, have 800 PSI pressing against them. them. Uh, when, when the engine is running, running only they only have 800, 80 PSI pressing against them when we're doing the compression test. So the little bits of contamination on the on the valve seat, for example, that 
would, would not, not have, have any effect when the, when the engine was actually running, running. Um, can, can hold the, can, can, can keep the exhaust valve, valve from, from, from seating fully uh, uh, during a compression test. test. Um, the, the ring, the, the, the compression rings um, stick out quite, quite far from the, from the, the, the cylinder, cylinder. I mean, uh, quite far from the piston when we're doing the compression test because the, the piston has is so much smaller than the cylinder bore. Whereas when the engine is actually running, um, the, the compression rings have a very, very thin, tiny annulus to seal up. So, so depending, depending on exactly, exactly where the piston, piston winds up landing, um, unfortunately, I've, I've got some diagrams of this, but I don't, I, I didn't include it in this particular um, PowerPoint deck. But depending on exactly how the piston is cocked when we're doing the compression test, um, there, there can be a hurricane blowing through the, the number one compression ring gap during the compression test. Uh, and, and there would be, be almost no compression ring gap, gap exposed when the engine is actually running. So, so there's just a lot of art, basic built-in artifacts of the of the compression test that, that cause this this level of unreliability. And there isn't really anything you can do about it. Um, that I mean the best you can do is to, to test the cylinders as hot as you possibly can. Um, and you know, I, I fly a a, a piston twin, twin with two, two six-cylinder six cylinder engines. So when, when I have, have to do a compression test, test on my airplane, I shut, shut the, the airplane down, down pull, pull it in the hangar, immediately pull the cowls off as quick as, as I can and start testing the 12, 12 cylinders one after another. And the first cylinder I test is going to be pretty darn hot. And the 12 cylinder I test is going to be pretty ice cold by the time I get to it. And, you know, this can just have a dramatic, uh, effect on on, uh, on 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 the results of the test. That's one of the reasons why when we do a, a retest where we go fly the airplane, bring it in and just test the one cylinder that we had a question about, we almost always get much higher compression readings because that's that cylinder it was the first one we test, the only one we test and it's and it's as hot as we can get it. Um, I suppose maybe, Maybe, Maybe there, there could be, be a, you know, improved procedure, procedure where you preheat each cylinder with a heat gun or something before you do the compression test. I don't know. I've never heard of anybody trying to do something like that. But the, the, the test is just fundamentally flawed. That's all there is to it. Doug is wondering, uh, can you give the uh, brand and model of Borescope again that you like? Oh, the one that I, the one that I'm using now and the one that I pictured is uh, Vividia, V-I-V-I-D-I-A. Um, able scope model VA 400, VA 400. And uh, if you Google uh, that, it'll the, probably the, the very first hit you'll get is, is going to be the Amazon listing for it. Great. Great. James uh, is wondering how does the bore scope evaluate the condition of the compression rings which it can't see? Well, it doesn't. Um, it, does, it doesn't, and, and um, uh, we, we, you know, the, the, the normally compression rings are not a problem. Compression, compression rings are, are, are in at least in conventional cylinders. Compression rings are are are, are chrome plated, and the cylinder barrel is steel, and so the the chrome is much harder than the steel, and so the wear is on the cylinder barrel, not on the not, not on, on the rings. rings. Now, now that's, that's a little different, different if you have chrome cylinders, cylinders where the where the compression rings are cast iron, iron and it's the rings that wear as opposed to the cylinder barrel that wear that wears, and that's a kind of a different situation. But at least for conventional steel cylinders, um, the, the 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 barrel is really the wear surface, not the rings, and 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 we we can see the barrel very well with the bore scope. If the, if the ring, ring if, if, if a compression ring, ring fractures, uh, then it tor normally leads, leaves vertical scoring on the barrel at the, you know, at the fracture point because there's a sharp edge. Um, but, but normally wear of, uh, of, of compression rings, at least chrome compression rings, is not really an issue because the chrome is so hard 
and it's, and it's running, running on a much softer surface. surface. And, and so, so it's, it's, it's the barrel, barrel that, that really, really does, does uh, almost, almost all, all of the wearing in the, in, on that interface. Okay, okay Barry is wondering, wondering are, are the expected and problem exhaust, exhaust valve, valve appearance patterns different for lycoming hollow stem sodium filled valves where the primary motor heat removal is via the stem and not the seat? Um, the, 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 the valves look a little different under the bore scope, but the basic rule for making a determination as to whether the valve has a problem or not, it doesn't change. Uh, it, that's, that's, that's why I really never talk about that, that you should be looking for a particular pattern or a particular color scheme or anything like that when you're looking at the, the valve. The, those, those things change pretty dramatically, both with, with, with different sorts of leaning techniques and, and with whether it's a continental lycoming. The, the, the thing you, we, the, that I always try to emphasize is that what we're looking for is symmetry versus asymmetry. If the valve is has a symmetrical appearance under the bore scope, then then it, it, it doesn't have a hot spot. It isn't leaking gas when the engine is actually running, regardless of what the compression rating says. Um, we know it's not leaking when the engine is running if, if it has a symmetrical appearance. And if it has an asymmetrical appearance, we know it's leaking. And that's the that that, that fundamental way of evaluating things works, you know, on 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 any you know engine with you know poppet style exhaust valves like like homings and Continentals and most most aircraft engines. Walt's, Walt's wondering, wondering how, how close can, can the bore scope probe be, be to the area of interest and still achieve proper focus? Um, I can't give you an exact answer to that, but pretty close. Uh, you can see from some of those pictures that, that we took with the, 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 the valves open where we were looking in and, and seeing the seed and the stem and all of that stuff um, that, that, uh, that you can get pretty close. Um, in fact, most of the pictures we take, we try to get pretty close because if, if the bore scope is backed up very far from what we're looking at, um, the lighting tends to go down and you don't get as good a picture because the, the bore scope uh, camera has a, a ring of LED lights surrounding it that is what provides the illumination for the pictures. And so we need to be fairly close um, to get adequate lighting. Okay, okay, Donald's, Donald's wondering, wondering, do the, do the valves, valves not have some rotating, rotating device to keep the wear surface wearing, wearing even and, and to help keep, keep them clean? Yes, yes most, most, most aircraft engines do, do have uh, uh, exhaust, exhaust valve rotator, rotator caps that cause the valve, valve to rotate a tiny fraction of degree every time it, every every time time it cycles open closed. and closed. Um, and, and in Lycoming's and Continentals, at it, it cruise RPM, typically, typically those valves rotate Somewhere, somewhere on the order of one RPM. Okay, Mimi is wondering, um, do, you do you offer any classes on using a bore scope or do you know of any place that does that you could recommend? Uh, you're, you're attending it. <laughs> I, th there was a time uh, back in between 2002 and 2010 that, that I did Live, live seminars and, and, and roamed around, around the country, country but nowadays, nowadays I don't do those anymore. I, all, all, all this, the, stuff the stuff I do is either, either on webinars or, or at events, events like AirVenture where I'm going to be giving 11 presentations, presentations this year on various, various subjects. Yeah, yeah great, great reach tonight, tonight by the way. Uh, my counter showed probably a little over 600 uh, logged that's, in. That's, that's fabulous. That may be our second highest number. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, Donald's By the wondering way, that, 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 that there were close to, was, was it close to uh, 700 videos in the? Uh, in the 400. We're, co we're coming up on 400 oh, videos in the archive. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I think close to 25% of those are mine. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. You're a significant <laughs> contributor, that's for sure. Thank you so much. People love you, too. Keep her coming, Mr. Mike. Okay. Uh, hey, Donald's wondering, can the bore scope method be used to inspect other interior areas of an engine, such as cam shafts, for signs of corrosion? 
Oh, you, oh, bet. you bet. You bet. You bet. Um, um, now, now it, again, it depends on the engine. engine. Um, Continentals, uh, uh, we can pull lifters and we can stick the bore scope in and take a real good look at cam lobes. Lycomings are more challenging to, to look at the cam. Sometimes you can work a bore scope down um, through through the, uh, the oil filler and, and see the the cam sometimes you can it kind of depends on the layout of the engine bore scopes can be really useful at looking at all sorts of other things and the vividia va 400 that i taught that i that i that i'm talking about that i use uh is a is a rigid bore scope i mean the tip flexes but the rest of it is is rigid um they also make a va 800 which is almost identical except that that, that it's it's, uh, it's, it's got, got a flexible, flexible uh, uh, shaft uh, uh, rather, rather than rather than a rigid one, one. and uh, it's, it's a little, a little bit more money. I think it was three hundred and fifty dollars for for the flexible, flexible one. one. That one you could you could, you could stick, stick up inside, inside of fuel lines, lines and just all, all kinds of cool things, things that you can do with a flexible one. It's the flexible one really doesn't provide any advantage if you're just inspecting cylinders, but there are certain kinds of Inspections, inspections that you might want to do um, where, where the where the uh, where flexible one would 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 be better suited. Yeah, yeah Terry just comments here that snap-on bore scope you recommended many webinars ago works great. Also, a bit more pricey, around nine hundred dollars. I purchased one and I'm delighted with it. He says. Yeah, no, it's a, that was a great unit, and that was the one I recommended until the video came out. It's just the, these these scopes just. Keep, keep getting, getting better, better and cheaper. cheaper. It's you know kind of like laptop computers or phones or whatever. And uh, uh, for years and years, I I, I kept saying you know I would love to be able to find a good quality bore scope under a thousand dollars, and I wasn't able to do it. And then finally, the thousand dollar barrier got broken, and it wasn't very much longer after that that, that the prices really came down dramatically. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's got to be other places on the airframe where uh, where a bore scope would come in handy too, isn't there? Up in the Absolutely. wing or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. You bet. Um, it's, very it's very common to use bore scopes for for uh, certain kinds of airframe inspections where you're looking at something that would be that would be hard to see uh, otherwise. They're 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 really great, very very useful. Yeah. Hey. Um, James, James is wondering, wondering are, are bore scope, scope inspections required on all Continental engines, including those from before the 50s, such as the E-series e -series engines? Well, th 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 that brings up an interesting issue. Um, the, 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 um, the service bullet in SBO 3-3, which introduced the uh, I'll say, quote, requirement, unquote, to do bore scope inspections whenever you do a compression check, um, stated that it, its applicability was to all all continental um, manufactured engines. Um, it did not uh, discriminate between models. Now, I said, I said um, you know, quote, required, unquote, because SBO3-3 is a service bulletin, and Service, service bulletins, bulletins, by definition, do not, do not have to be complied with by Part 91 operators. Even, even mandatory service bulletins, so-called so -called mandatory, mandatory service bulletins, bulletins don't have to be complied with by Part 91 operators, operators. Um, um, even, even though the, the manufacturer may consider it mandatory, but, but, but Part 91 operators don't, don't have to do them because the FAA, FAA doesn't, doesn't require it. Um, the... the, um, the, the uh, Interesting, interesting thing that happened, that I mentioned, was last year, was last year when Continental, Continental took SBO3-3 and a bunch, and a bunch of other service, service bulletins, bulletins, canceled them, and, and incorporated their contents, essentially without change, into a, into a maintenance manual, manual called Manual X, um, X-0. Um, it, 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 I think it's called the Standard Practices, Practices Manual or for, for Continental or Engines or something along that line. And, and so the so question, question arises, did Continental's action last year of moving SBO3-3 from being a service bulletin to being a portion of a maintenance manual make those bore scope inspections compulsory for Part 91 operators? Um, 
I'm sort, I'm sort of inclined to think that it did, but I don't believe that anybody's ever called the question with the FAA on it to, to, to get a definitive answer. You'd really have to send a request for interpretation to the Office of General Counsel and, and, and at the FAA headquarters and wait six months or so uh, for them to write you back the letter and give you a formal interpretation. And as far as I know, nobody's ever really asked that question. Uh, but, uh, it's but it's an interesting question. question. Yeah. yeah. James, James is wondering, is there any reason to keep periodic photos to look for trends, or is this better just for pass-fail? Um, uh, I don't know. I actually tend to, tend to, to, to keep the borescope photos that I do on my airplane. Um, uh, archived on my on my laptop, the one that I normally hook up to the borescope. Um, I, I don't think many mechanics do keep archives like that. They, they just they just use them, use, use the look at the look at the images and and get rid of them. Um, but I think it's a useful thing. I'm, I'm not going to say it's super important and make a make a strong recommendation. But I, but it, but I do it. Uh, that, uh, that way. I think it's good practice. practice. Mm -hmm. uh, Luis, uh, Luis is just, just wondering, wondering, will excess deposits from running uh, uh, too rich gradually be reduced, be reduced if the engine, engine is ran lean, lean of peak? peak? Yes. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, okay chat's, chat's just wondering, wondering how about Nicosil? Cylinders. cylinders are they, are they harder, harder than chrome, chrome? and what, what kind, kind of ring should be used with these for best, for best compression versus, versus life well well i'm not i'm i'm, I'm not a metallurgist um, um it, it is my, my understanding, understanding that that um that, that nicosil is not as hard as chrome but is, but is significantly harder than steel, than steel. um and, and I, know I know that the rings, rings that are used with, with those, those cylinders, cylinders um, the, the nickel, the the the, the, um, the, carbide the carbide impregnated uh, uh, nickel plated, plated cylinders, um, are, are are special rings. rings. Uh, uh, I know Continental uses a number, a number one, one, a very special, special number one compression, compression ring that is that is plasma face. face. It's actually a a chrome, a chrome ring, ring that has a kind of a, kind of a hollow ground, ground into it, it and, and, uh, um, and, and a, 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 a plasma coating, coating applied to it, to it which is the actual wear surface. Wear surface. Um, I, don't I don't know whether that, that kind of ring is used universally with all carbide, carbide impregnated nickel cylinders, nickel cylinders or whether that's only the, the, ECI, the ECI cylinders, cylinders which are now the now continental. Um, uh, Nick, Nick three, three, I guess they call, they call her cylinders, cylinders. Um, but but they, I I know that they do use pretty special compression rings, not just the, the standard rings that are used with steel cylinders, and and not the cast iron rings that are used with chrome either. I wish I could tell you more, but that's that's getting a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, William's wondering if. Uh, uh, if a, if a mechanic new to bore scoping is not sure about the cylinder or valve condition, is there some way to get another person on another opinion on damage using the pictures from a bore scope? Yeah, we do that kind of thing all the time. I get lots of people sending me bore scope images. I got one that came in the 4th of July that I unfortunately haven't looked at. So if whoever it is who sent it to me is is on the webinar. My apologies. I'll get I'll be be home tomorrow and I'll get to it. But yeah, um, no, no, there there are there are a handful of people who are very knowledgeable about borescope image interpretation and and uh, um, I think most of them, including me, are are quite quite amenable to. Uh, to, 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 to giving second opinions if you need one. Mm -hmm. Donald says, using my scope, the biggest hurdle I have is getting that 180 degree view back at the valves. I'm thinking the VA 400 solves that, but I'm wondering if there are any attachments for the scopes out there. 
Yeah, you know, the, you see, a lot of the cheap scopes come with, like, mirror attachments that you can snap on that have angled mirrors on them. Um, they don't really work very well um, because it's almost impossible to use a mirror um, and, and, and not get um, – Oil, oil and, and dirt, dirt on, the on the mirror and screw up the image. Up the, image. Um, um, the the um, uh, the, uh, the uh, snap-on snap -on scope, scope that somebody, somebody mentioned earlier um, had has a special probe with two cameras, cameras that allows uh, both zero degree and ninety degree uh, viewing. viewing, and then the the VA four hundred and VA eight hundred have. This articulating, this articulating head that is actually infinitely, infinitely adjustable between zero and 180 degrees, and it's 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 it's, it's pretty much the the, the best solution yet, yet. I think prior, prior to, to the advent of of the video, video scopes, um, um, there were variable um, viewing, viewing angle scopes, scopes available, available, but they were very very very, very expensive, expensive. You know, five thousand dollar plus kinds of scopes. Scope. So. The Vividia is really, really the first inexpensive, inexpensive scope that has that capability, and it's a very useful capability. Jake, Jake is wondering, wondering, doing an annual and a compression test, test fails, how do, how I, do I do the logbook, logbook entry to allow a one-hour flight test? test? Well, well that, 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 that's, that's interesting because that's exactly the question that the mechanic in Florida asked me when I said, no, don't pull that cylinder, go fly, go let the owner fly the airplane for an hour. And he said, how am I supposed to do that <laughs> with, a, with a 38 over 80 cylinder? And I said, you write in your logbook entry that the cylinder measured 38 over 80, but the, but, the, but the bore scope did not reveal any obvious cause for the, for the problem, and that in compliance with SBO 3-3, which was in, in effect at that time, um, that, 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 that the cylinder is, uh, is not yet considered unairworthy, and then sign off the annual as airworthy and have the guy fly it and bring it back. And I, and I promised him he would, him he would bring, it bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah I mean that it's it's funny, it's funny that that that, uh, that, 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 that question was asked because, asked because that was precisely the question that the that the A and P mechanic down the the, the, the director maintenance actually of the shop in Florida asked when we said no, oh, we need to fly the airplane and retest it. And he, and he said, how am I supposed to do that? You know, how am I supposed to sign off this airplane to be legal to fly? And I essentially gave him some verbiage, and he was okay with it and made a logbook entry. And Fred's just wondering, um, why do you have to go fly the aircraft? What about just doing a ground run? Well, it's really hard to get the cylinder up to full operating temperature without flying the airplane. Um, I mean, you could do a ground run. We don't like to do high-power ground runs because you're running the engine, but there's not any significant cooling airflow over the engine. So it's just kind of a, a bad procedure to try to heat up a cylinder by running the engine on the ground. Um, you can heat it up some, but to, to really... Do it, right. do it right. You really should fly the airplane, and that's, you know, you know, that's what the that's what Continental's guidance tells you to do. It says fly it for at least forty-five minutes. So, so we so we you know, we've got we've got good documentary justification for doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Colleen, Colleen just, just makes a comment. She uses her Vividia bore scope to inspect the carry through spar on her cantilever wing Cessna Cardinal. Hi, Colleen. Yeah, she's Colleen is the one that, that put me onto the Vividi in the first place. She 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 sent a bunch of us an email saying, "Ooh, look what look look at this new borescope I just got!" And within about fifteen minutes, I was on Amazon ordering mine. <laughs> Good news travels. Thank, thank you, Colleen. <laughs> right on. Gail is wondering, would the flexible shank borescope warrant an extra $150 over the less expensive rigid scope, for example, the VA-800 over the VA-400? Well, it just depends what you're using it for. For, 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 for you know, evaluating cylinder condition, it's, it, it, it really provides no advantage. 
Um, it might provide advantage for some other kinds of inspections, but not, but not for, not for, uh, not, not for inspecting cylinders. The, the rigid one is, is perfectly adequate for that. Okay. Okay. And Larry's wondering if there's any uh, significant differences uh, um, when looking at a radial engined cylinder. Well, I, I really don't have any experience working on on radials, um, but but I don't I don't see any reason why uh, boroscopy would be significantly different. The viewing, the viewing angles, angles might be a little bit different because the spark plugs are kind of canted a little differently uh, on, on radial cylinders. But uh, other than that, I think everything would work about the same. I've mm had -hmm. hmm. a number of people ask about inspecting of the rings. So, you know, not being able to look at the rings with a bore scope. People are wondering how you judge the condition of them. We've probably had. 15, 15 different questions, questions on, well, what, about well, what about the rings when, when you can't see, see them? Can you just talk about that a little bit more? Bit more? Well, well, there's really no way to, uh, to, to, to determine the condition of rings, you know, you know other than pulling a cylinder off, which we don't want to do. Want um, so, so, you know, you know if, if, the if the cylinder barrel, barrel doesn't, doesn't have, have any obvious scoring type damage, damage and, if and if the cylinder is not using an unacceptably high amount of oil, then we, then we have, have to assume, assume that the ring pack is okay. Um, it, 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 we, 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 we really can only practically make that determination in a very indirect fashion, short, short, short of you know, pulling, you know, pulling the cylinder and exposing the rings, and we certainly don't want to be doing that as a, as a, on a routine basis during inspection. So the, the answer is it would you know be nice if there was, like, there was a like a little viewing port, port on the side of the cylinder or something, or something but they don't, make, they don't them make them that way, so we really, really don't have any good way to, 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 to do that. And, and Dwight, Dwight was just wondering, would a Rotax, Rotax 912 valve in cylinders, cylinders, cylinders look similar to the one shown for the Continentals and Lycomings? Well, again, well, again I've, I've never, never, I've never actually, actually had the opportunity to do a borescope inspection on a Rotax, but I assume that uh, other, other than, than everything being, being a lot, a lot smaller, a lot smaller. <laughs> um, because, because the Rotax, the Rotax cylinders, cylinders have have quite, have quite um, small small displacement. displacement. Uh, uh, the, the 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 engine runs runs at fifty four hundred RPM, so it has a, it's a very small displacement engine to get a hundred horsepower. Um, but other, but other than, than everything being sort of in miniature, I, I, I assume that all of the basic rules for inspecting the borescope scope be the same. Paul might, Paul Chuck might be the, the guy to answer that question if he's still hanging around. Yeah, as far as I know, they have a, 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 a piston crown and a exhaust valve and intake valve and spark plug, uh, two of them. So I think they all have the same things. They got cylinder walls, cross hatching. David, David is wondering, is wondering um, do, you do you enter, enter the top, top or bottom spark, spark plug hole with the scope? With the scope? Well, well, most of the time we scope, we scope through the top spark, spark plug hole because just because it's, it, it, it involves less, less contortion by, by the person, person who's doing, doing the scoping. Uh, occasionally, uh, occasionally there'll be things that we want to get a look at that you can get a better view from the bottom. And, and, and so it's not unheard of to stick the scope in through the bottom. Um, um, I've also, I've also uh, had cases where, where um, we'll, we'll put the, put the bore scope in one, one spark, spark plug hole, hole and we'll insert some, some supplementary, supplementary lighting of some sort um, into, into another, another hole just to get a little bit more light, light and get a better, get a better picture, picture of something that's hard to see. Um, but most, most of the time, of the time it's the inspection, the inspection is done through the top spark plug hole just for Convenience, convenience of not, not having to be squatting, be squatting while you're manipulating the, the, probe. the probe. Okay. okay. Lyle's, Lyle's wondering, when are, when are lead, lead deposits on the valve ceiling, ceiling seats worrisome when you're, when you're doing a bore scope? They're, 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 they're never really worrisome. Um, the, 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 the rule I use about lead deposits um, is, is, is that um, if lead deposits are at a sufficient level that the air that the engine is suffering 
uh, uh, lead fouling or spark plugs, then that's, then that's clearly, clearly of concern and something needs to be done about it. Uh, uh, otherwise, um, it's, 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 it's not an issue. An issue. But, but uh, generally, uh, large, large buildups of lead deposits is an indicative of running, running pretty, pretty cold combustion, combustion temperatures that don't allow the lead scavenging, scavenging agent in the fuel, fuel to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, adequately, adequately uh, scavenge, scavenge the lead and turn, turn, turn it into, into, into gas, gas that, that goes out the exhaust. Out the exhaust. Gotcha. And gotcha. And if, 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 you know, if there's real excessive buildup of lead, you, you can add supplementary scavenging agents. You can put some TCP in the fuel uh, to, to help scavenge the lead a little bit better. But usually just uh, a little better attention to leaning will solve the problem, particularly leaning pretty aggressively during ground operations, which is where we get a lot of the lead buildup because the engine is operating at low power. We also tend to see... More lead, more lead build up, build up on, engines on engines that that have um, that, are, that, are that are used in surveillance type operations, operations uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline patrol, patrol, fish spotting, spotting FBI surveillance airplanes, where they, where they are flying around at 45, 50 percent power for long periods of time. Of time you know, kind of looking, looking down for, for on stuff. at stuff, and, and uh, because, because of the, the continue. continue Low power, low power operation, operation they, they, they tend, to tend to run pretty cold, cold combustion temperatures, temperatures and don't get real good lead scavenging and we and, 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 and suffer more, more lead buildup than than, 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 than than typical engine. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. gotcha. A, nice A nice comment here from Lynn. Lynn. She, she says, says that the Rotex valves run typically cooler than Continental or Lycoming. Further, Further, running, running on, on unleaded, unleaded fuel, fuel, they, they are, are not, not contaminated. contaminated. My experience is the valves just look dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, makes the, sense. Uh, they got the liquid cool cooled heads, heads, I guess, that they would be cooler. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, and it's 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 a it's a great advantage to be running on unle unleaded fuel. Uh, I mean, I, uh, that's 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 um, that's very, that's very advantageous because lead, lead is. Other than, other than boosting octane, octane lead is just a very, very rotten, rotten stuff, stuff to have, to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and causes all sorts of problems. Um, um, lots of the contamination, I mean, it shortens our oil change, change intervals. It, it, it builds, builds up in, in, various, in various portions, portions of the combustion chamber. chamber. It can, can cause oil control, oil control ring, ring sticking. sticking. It can, can cause all sorts of nasty things. things. Hey, I, know, hey, I know a lot of people uh, during, the during the course of this presentation probably went to Amazon and bought one of those uh, borescopes. <laughs> and we got a we got a little note from Charles here. Charles says a word of caution in using the VA 400, leaving the scope in the spark plug hole while rotating the prop oh. to open the valve can crush the camera to up between the piston and the valve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah, and that's, that's not just don't break your new toy. That's just not that's not just true of the VA four hundred. That's true of any any bore scope. Um, you 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 basically want to pull a pull a bore scope out out of the hole. Not it doesn't necessarily have to come all the way out of the hole. It can it can it can be just stuck in there very shallowly where you can kind of see the the valve opening, but you don't want it to be pushed pushed in very far because it, it, you can damage it when you when you're rotating the propeller. All right, Mike. Well, we've reached the end of our time here. Uh, sure to appreciate you being with us tonight. Please take a moment and share closing comments with everybody who was tuned in. Like I said, I think we were up to about 600 at one point. That's fabulous. How many of you guys are going to be at AirVenture? I'm going to be doing 11 different presentations on the Forums Plaza, two every day of this show except for... Saturday, Saturday when I'm doing three, three and Thursday, Thursday, Thursday when I'm not doing any because I've got some other commitments, but I'll be doing, I'll be doing 11 different presentations this year, this year and I would, I would be delighted, delighted to have you guys, have you guys attend and introduce, introduce yourself afterwards, afterwards and do a little, do a, little uh, a little networking. Um, as usual, as usual uh, if, you if you haven't done so already, already um, I invite you to sign up for my Monthly, monthly newsletter, newsletter at savvyaviation.com, savvy or, uh, or uh, at the end, at the end of this webinar, uh, Tim's going to put up a, 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 survey, a survey, and, and uh, there's, there's a checkbox on the survey that you, that you can check, and we'll put you on the mailing list for the uh, for the monthly e-newsletter. It's 
all about, all about maintenance, maintenance stuff and, and, and uh, engine, engine analysis, analysis stuff, and hopefully, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, my, book my book manifesto is available at Amazon. Amazon. I'm working on a second book that, uh, that uh, and Colleen is, is, is my editor, by the way. Hi, Colleen, Colleen again. And, and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're targeting, uh, um, to have the second, second book, which is going to be a book on, book on engines, engines. going to be a, a quite a large book, actually. actually. We, um, to be, to be done sometime, sometime around March or April and definitely in print, in print and on Amazon in time for uh, Air Venture 2018. Um, so uh, if you're interested in getting involved in the creation of that book, uh, you might want to take a look at my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Savvy Aviator. And uh, we've, got uh, we've got a, a, group, a group of people who uh, are getting, who are getting um, proofs, proofs of the of the cover art and and proofs of the individual, individual chapters as they get ready for so that, so that we can get some feedback and stuff. And, stuff. and I'd, I'd love for you guys, you guys to be involved in that. Um, and let's, and let's see. I think that's that's that's, uh, uh, that's probably all I have, Tim. Until and, until uh, the next uh, oh, the, the next webinar, webinar will be. Uh, a, week a week later than usual. Than usual. Uh, the the these are, these are usually the first Wednesday, Wednesday of the month, but the first Wednesday of August. Uh, uh, I'm 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 going to be in in, uh, in uh, Air, Air Venture withdrawal mode. mode. So the so the, so the next, next webinar is uh, is going to be August 9th um, instead of August second. And uh, uh, these are the next uh, next three three. Um, Wednesday, Wednesday webinars uh, the, the, uh, coming up and. Uh, It'd be great, It'd be if, great we if we got this, this kind of the kind of turnout we got tonight. So that's, so that's all, I all I have, Tim. Wonderful, wonderful Mike. Mike. Thank, thank you so much for spending, spending your evening with us. With and us. and uh, please, please extend our thank you to your to your friend whose uh, house you're at uh, using his internet connection. Uh, everything worked out great. Uh, good performing uh, internet connection there. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, Mike. Very good. Very good. Thank you. To everybody, to everybody who, tuned who tuned in tonight, tonight thank you so much for joining us, us and hope you can join us next, next week. Remember, remember, we got a whole lineup next week. We got webinars on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. A full week of webinars next week. Thanks, Thanks everybody, everybody, and have a great, have a great evening. evening. Night, everybody. Night, everybody.